I wanted to tell you first uh, how I approach the course, which is uh, the reverse. It's exactly in opposite order of textbooks, although it, I'm probably too late because <laughs> I've seen one textbook coming out that is actually uh, in that order. Um, in any case, and what I want to talk to you about is why I do it this way, as well as tell you, share with you things. I share with the students about pain and touch, probably that's all we'll have time to do. Uh, either interesting, fi interesting uh, empirical finding or interesting twists or interesting angles, that sort of thing. And I would very much like to be interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, uh, it's not much fun to just talk at people. So please, um, and any time, either clarification or comments or whatever, it's more than welcome. So before we, I start, though, I'm going to be out of order with one of my slides. And one thing I do with the students, as well as prospective students here when I uh, talk to them, is I ask them at the beginning of the course, uh, uh, if you had to lose one of your senses, so you can keep all the others, which one would you lose and why? And if you had to keep only one, which one would you keep and why? And if you're not too bashful, I think I'd love your reaction to that. Um, there's no right or wrong answer, of it, although I have my Prejudices, okay. <laughs> I, as a child, I say I would have to keep vision. Mm -hmm. And which one would you lose if you had to? Taste. Taste, okay. I'd lose taste and keep touch. And keep touch, okay. I would lose smell. You would lose smell. Because when I go into like the perfume store, they get washes. <laughs> My son does too. Uh, yeah, there are lots of smell. <laughs> uh, and which one would you keep sight? You keep sight. Okay, I, I unfortunately, I, we don't have time for everyone, but let me do this. Who would, if you kept one, who would vote for sight? Okay, who would vote for hearing? Who would vote for touch? You, somebody said, yeah? Who would vote, what's left? Taste? Smell? And pain is, is a sense. Okay, so vision has it, right? Um, all right, so we'll see what develops in the, you know, in the next hour um, and whether by any chance you change your mind. I'm not saying you have to, but uh, I'm really not. <laughs> okay, so um, here, sorry for the small letters here. So basically, this is what I start with, this is what I end with. And the reason is that it's very hard to motivate vision. In other words, if you take a class on September 1st, whatever, and you say, we are going to understand how vision works, and on average, the students will look at you and say, what do you mean? You just need light and light makes things visible, and yeah, light hits your retina, and that's how you really know the apple is there, but big deal. Or, okay, fine, we're going to learn how the retina works. Now, what I try to teach is that, well, that there is a deep problem to solve with vision, that no, yes, you need light to see, but to say light makes things visible, is really a, you know, not saying very much. How does it? And I try to, over the course of vision, to say that light is both, yes, the carrier of what excites your retina, I, I am not denying that obviously, but also is the carrier of information about objects. So when the light hits the apple, you know, some of the wavelengths get selected and it hits your uh, retina at a certain angle, it makes the patches on the retina of a certain size, and da 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 da. <laughs> but the fact is that there are no apples in your mind or your brain or anything like that. So, vision is really a construction process by which 
your brain processes a lot of information from your retina in lots of different ways and then somehow puts it together and you experience an apple. But in between, and then I go philosophical a little bit, not too much because not many students stick to it, we don't really know what's out there. You see it as an apple, but, uh, and a student made my day saying, uh, one day saying, yes, and my philosophy the professor Pader here says, what apple? <laughs> <laughs> so she got it. Um, so, but it's very hard to start a class that way, a course that way, um, because it's a complicated idea that you construct an understanding of out of the data that your retina uh, provides, and it ends up um, being experienced as an apple. Okay, so on the other hand, pain is not hard to motivate in several ways. First, it's very interesting, so emotionally, uh, you know, students will either be horrified or interested or both by the different gory details I present about pain or, or not too much. Uh, so there is an intrinsic emotional interest, but it's also much simpler because unlike, of course, there's an apple there, so you see it as long as there's light, you don't live in, I mean, most of us do not live in pain, so pain is an abnormal event. And therefore, there's something to explain, because everything that doesn't work according to normal requires an explanation. So automatically, if I say, let's understand pain, that makes a lot more sense to students uh, as, as an enterprise. Also, um, unlike the apple, pain is, pay, uh, you perceive the apple as the thing out there as you should, because if the caveman hadn't seen the tigers out there and had said, the tiger is a construction of my mind, da, 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 we wouldn't be here, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's very important we see the apple as out there and that we perceive it automatically and don't think about how it happens. Uh, it's also important we take our finger away from the stove or the, the, the finger, but that's taken care of as well. But basically, Pain is an inner, you know the pain is not in the knife, right? Uh, the pain is in you. And so you experience it inside instead of outside. So that's much more compatible with an understanding the role of the brain and the nervous system, which is also part of you. Uh, and then, as I said, it's an abnormal event. So you can say, how does the knife, which doesn't have pain in it, whereas the apple is appleness in it, so the knife is not painful. How do you go from cutting your skin to a painful experience? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, after covering sort of the philosophy of the course. So what that allows me to do is introduce the a sort, of, uh, a sort of meta vocabulary in terms of transduction, your transmission, processing, receptors, uh, pathways, all of those things within the context, which is not too overwhelming. Um, it allows me to do a lot about the role of the brain because not everybody perceives pain the same way. There are cultural effects, so there are lots of systems interacting with each other, so I, <coughs> I can have a foray into not construction, pain is pain, but certainly the, the way that it's mediated by a lot of factors in an understandable, well, to most, um, way. And then you can slowly generalize to other things. So, um, that's what I said, <laughs> more or less. Um, so, oops, sorry, this is, okay. So, um, this is what I, the essence of what I teach in the pain. So I spend a lot of time on pain. And if you look at textbooks, there are two pages on pain and the half the textbook on vision. And I spend a third of the semester, well, not quite on pain and touch. And anyway, um, so the knife cuts my skin. It causes intense skin deformation. I can talk about the external energies, mechanical energy in this case. 
that causes electric activity in my skin receptors. There's transduction, signals go along pathways towards my cortex. There are neural transmission and I'm experiencing pain. So this is what I call the sensation perception lens, meaning that's the, a way, a way. And I tell students, there are other ways to study perception, obviously, than through uh, that by uh, talking about the brain, but that's the, the approach I take. Uh, so the, it's a lens through which you uh, analyze and systematize perceptual experiences. Okay, and then um, it can be generalized. I mean, not the next day, but I've just, it's the same words, but it's applied to vision. It's a, I mean, almost the same words, right? And so the goal is that they see the relationship between the two. That doesn't make vision, vision is more complicated than pain. There is no doubt. Uh, and, but at least it um, makes the issues a little more transparent. Any questions, comments so far? Okay. Um, so, touch is next because as for pain, you have to, I mean, something acts on you with touch or you act on something to touch something. Whereas with vision, it's like, you know, you sit there and you see, right? But so there is something in common between touch and pain. And then it's a little more complex because there are several kinds of receptors. And uh, by the way, um, I never have time, nor are the students particularly thrilled, but I absolutely love the biomechanical, the engineering aspect of skin receptors. It, it's one of the, I mean, I'm enthusiastic about many things, but <laughs> I just think that the way those things work is absolutely mind blowing. Um, so, and then, of course, in this case, the texture of something, etc., it's out there. Unlike, you know, there is an outside stimulus, but that's sort of, that's what in my work on science teaching, I call a stepping stone. So it's a way towards understanding vision in this case, that's not as complicated to master, but helps you get there more easily than if you had done it. So it's a learning progression, if you wish. Um, then I go to test, taste, and smell, which also have outside stimuli that have to travel to your nose or, or be on your tongue, etc. And then I use the same, what I showed you the previous slide, before, during, and after each sense. I say, okay, let's review the lens, what's different, what's the same, and hopefully uh, it, it, over the semester, it makes the perceptual lens, uh, the perception lens uh, more meaningful. Okay. So in other words, once we reach vision, hopefully the students at least understand there's something to explain and have perhaps a little bit of a framework to do it. So, catching students, yes? Uh, Marianne, by problematize, you mean turning this into a, an analytic procedure? Okay, good. Uh, thank you for catching me on this. It's a, 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 a jargon word from learning science. Uh, it means making it a problem, making it something that's worth thinking about and finding a solu doing problem solving and finding a solution about it. In other words, it is not the case that there is nothing to explain about vision other than the light hits it and reaches your eye. It means turning into a real inquiry topic uh, worth spending your time on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's, thank you. Yeah, it's, a, as I said, jargon word. Um, so catching the student's interest, why do we feel pain? That allows me to introduce the evolutionary argument that is a theme. I then want the student to know why can mean many things. <laughs> and we have to keep things straight, but there is a why in the sense of evolution. There is a why in terms of how the receptors work. There are lots of different whys, but that's an important one. What would life be without pain? I'll get to that. Uh, we talk about pain relief, which is interesting because they're familiar with that. They also have no somebody with fibromyalgia or intractable pain of other kinds, and uh, we can talk about that. 
Um, and then we talk about cultural effects, which is interesting as well. Um, and basically, I tr then I present different pathways and say, look, it explains a lot of things. It explains why you take Tylenol rather than aspirin for headaches, but you take Aleve rather than something else for muscle pain, whatever. I, I know it when I teach it. Uh, and uh, you know why people did lobotomies long ago, and what's carpal tunnel syndrome, and, and we relate, I'll show you, we relate that to simple, well, to me, simple to them, horrifying pathways, diagrams. Uh, but basically, I try to say I'm not making you suffer for the sake of it, uh, but there is a reason to learn these pathways because they explain things. And then you, we can play problem solving. Like, if somebody uh, had pain here, what could you do to help this person? Or why, given the diagrams that I showed you, why do you, how do you think hypnosis works to relieve pain and stuff like that? So they, it allows them to do some problem solving instead of just memorizing all those very arcane words. Okay, this I'm going to go quickly on because I have the feeling you, you know this. I mean, uh, uh, so I also try to make it interesting to them, like why you shouldn't turn your iPod so loud. <laughs> <laughs> and of course take drugs, but um, and then uh, related to all sorts of things about real life, different. Uh, so all this is in your um, handouts, which is why, is it okay if I just move on and, um, all right. Uh, consumer marketing, why they have no green lights over the lettuce and uh, <laughs> yellow lights over the red pepper. Um, and of course, we in the course of the, the uh, in the course of the course, we talk about hearing aids and cochlear Im implants and uh, surgery. And I try to have somebody actually who had a cochlear implant to try to explain what the experience was, which I highly recommend if you know somebody who is willing, uh, because it's not what people think, and it's really worth hearing from somebody who, who had a, an implant, what the experience is like. There's a great little video that you can show that shows a little girl who had a cochlear implant at age two and how she hears sound for the very first time in her expression. Yes, that's right. Yes. yes, that's right. Perfect. perfect. That's right, that. that's right. But then what uh, adults will tell you, even those who are very happy with their implant, is that it's very uh, uh, unsettling when you first have it because you hear clicks, you yeah. don't hear, especially if you had hearing before and you know what it was like to hear music or, or speech, it's nothing like that. So you have to re-educate yourself to sort of translate those clicks. That's what I've been told uh, into sound. So I think it's well worth uh, anything that it seems to me in high school that makes students aware of other worlds, either social ones or perceptual ones or motor ones is, I find very important. Um, all right. And then there is, should you have any intellectual curiosity? <laughs> you know, what do infants perceive? Um, why do we see in black and white at night, etc.? And then I try to balance for, because of course, individual styles, uh, some metaphysics, will we ever know the external world, nor the tree in the forest, of course, although they, they know that one. Um, do the senses tell the truth? If a Martian had eyes and a Martian brain, what would the Martian coming to Earth see? Um, this one is interesting, would a person blind from birth who recovers her sight, what do they see? And I have actually one of my uh, mentors when I was a graduate student is involved, has studied that sort of thing for a long time, first with babies because now it's caught uh, early and therefore cataract can uh, be operated on I think around four months or something like that. But in the old days, uh, in the old days, <laughs> <laughs> when I was young, um, it, it, there was no, I don't think, such detection. And it was not until people were not operated in their cataract until late. But by then, there is the um, sensitive critical period. So 
your brain, I mean, atrophies is not the word, but your visual cortex loses its, a lot of its ability. And you can recover, you know, light hits your retina. But uh, as an adult, there's not a whole lot. I mean, it depends, but uh, some people have been incredibly depressed after uh, cataract removal because it's nothing like what they hope for. And they are essentially at least legally blind. Mm -hmm. They see light colors, but, and so it comes, uh, and in a way life was simpler, with, no, given how little this, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm not making a judgment, I'm just reporting some of the things I've read. Okay, so with babies, they're still malleable enough if you, I mean, their brain. <laughs> Uh, that then that problem doesn't occur, and, and with visual experience, they develop completely normally. But then now there is, uh, you know, those doctors who go help people in, you know, uh, less privileged countries where there are cataracts still uh, in adults or older children, etc. And so they are also at the, so they are relieving that at the same time doing research in. Uh, young people at of different ages to see uh, how much they recover, etc. So that's, for example, something I would include in my readings uh, next time um, that should be interesting. All right, and so they also say, why is it that it's very easy to tell which of the two sets of black dots uh, has more dots, but you have to if you like me, you have to count the blue. You can't do it with the blue ones. You have to count, right? And uh, so that's a particularly perceptual. So we have, I don't teach about that. I teach about that in cognitive development. But we have two systems uh, that rats have and a lot of other animals. Uh, one, to keep track of a small number of things. And that's what I call the, how the mother keeps track of whether you know, there is quack and lack and knack and if they're all there. Uh, <laughs> but then there is this, which is processed through what's called the magnitude estimation system, which is a way, it doesn't tell you it's the same. It tells you whether there's more or not. If there are enough more on one side than the other, and babies it has to be twice as many, but they show you they know. And then adults, it's about 25%. Uh, so if I, and they are on, there, there's only a difference of one, so that's why I would think that you didn't immediately know. Um, anyway, there's lots of very interesting things, and so developing counting, among other things, consists through the words involved in counting, linking these two things to each other to get a sense of number. That's part of my research, but <laughs> that's not what I teach. Okay, then I say, why do we have sensory and perceptual systems? Do plants, you know, how do we differ from plants? Why do plants don't have vision? <laughs> and that can create interesting classroom discussions. <laughs> because people have very, as you know, probably, different people have very different ideas about plants, right? I mean, some, so uh, it's, it's not just entertaining. I think it's interesting. I don't think that students necessarily have thought about why do we have a nervous system and plants don't, uh, or at least not much of one, and why, and that it's related to the fact we move and they do don't. And that's an important fact, and that's not necessarily something that's taught in biology. I think. Uh, okay, so I want to now go back. To pain. Do you have any questions about the teaching of sensation perception in general or my course in general before I go into specific topics? Do you connect um, this, these, sorts, these sorts of problems into brain areas? Yes, that's going to come. Yeah, yeah. Not, I try not to overwhelm them with it, and I don't know the test is not about the names. <laughs> and with my pain diagram, you're going to see soon, I basically, on the, on the exam, I sh have an unlabeled diagram because I don't want them to s memorize it for the sake. But yes, no, it's actually a very important part of it is to show the role of the brain uh, as an interpreter. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this. You know what pain is for. Um, so, oops, 
One thing that I find interesting is that when you hurt yourself, your body releases histamines to increase, to maintain and increase the pain. Maybe you all know this. And so that you will pay more attention to it. Um, and yes. And then what's also interesting is that the nerve signals, talking about uh, the ner role of the nervous system, are very different from for the, maintain the pain that maintains you, you know, in, in one place and taking care of it versus the immediate reaction. And it's a totally different mechanism with extremely different speed of neural transmission. Can I go on at this pace, right, given you have the, yeah? Uh, Okay, so this one, I, you don't have to read all this, but basically um, it's about recent work in uh, neurology, uh, which by way, I mean, it's relevant to how we learn to avoid painful stimuli. And basically you have originally neurons that um, respond to intense, to intense stimuli. And then you have others that, we, that encode dangerous visual stimuli. And then when you touch the fire or cut yourself with a knife or whatever, the two, I'm simplifying needless to say, the two neurons connect and remain connected. So next time you see a knife or the needle at the doctor, <laughs> you have a, <laughs> uh, a warning signal. Um, and you also feel it about others if you're not a psychopath. Uh, meaning when you see the needle approach somebody else's arm, the same neurons are going to get into play and you will feel, that's how you feel empathy. I mean, that's one of the mechanisms for, for empathy. So it's a little bit like mirror neurons, but it's not. It's, yeah, it's thinking of mirror neurons. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, I'm sorry. That isn't a mirror neuron. No. no, those are not mirror neurons. They are visual neurons and then pain. Uh, I don't like to call them this way because it looks like they are really different. I mean, some neurons have spectacles and others. But yeah, so they are the pain, the one in the pain system. I mean, they are in the temporal lobe, but uh, they are neurons that originally react only if you get hurt. And then they are neurons early, early, originally that reacts to visual stimuli and then they get connected. They design to be connected, obviously. And now they both fire at the same time when you see without feeling the pain. And that's the basis of a warning signal. So is that evidence of learning? Yes, that's definitely evidence of learning. Oh yeah, yes. Now, it's uh, also evidence of a predisposition uh, and uh, I don't know how much we want to go into the nature nurture, but certainly the learning wouldn't take place if there was not something that predisposed those neurons. It's not any neuron randomly that connects. So not every neuron, when you look at a fire, lots of neurons are activated while you look at it. Not all of them are potentially, even potentially connecting to your pain neuron. So there is a, I would say, genetically predisposed, you know, potential connection about which I know nothing, but that means that given the right experience, the connection will be made. So what I try, that's, I love the question because it's a tough topic for young students and you know, that it's 100% nature and 100% nurture, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily obvious, but that's certainly my mantra. Yes? The last point means that um, not only the person who's being being uh, being pricked, yeah, but has but to the look at it. Yes, the same brain areas are active. You can see this in a CAT scan, for example. Yeah. All right, if you're being examined. Like yes. That. So the act of observing triggers exactly the same sort of brain activity as as, as, as the act. Brain. Yes. So in that sense, it's a bit like it's in spirit, like motor neurons, where you know at first you have to act to activate them and then you just have to think about acting or just the verb. And I don't know if you know this, that the, when you listen to sentences, the verbs like jumping, let's see, when you hear jumping, it activates the neurons, the motor neurons that are involved in jumping. And I, that's another thing I love. <laughs> that's why visualization I'll get to you in one second. Yeah, that's why visualization exercises. Exactly. 
That's right. That's why it's not an idol. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and also it solves a lot of stuff in language and language development. Where does meaning come from? And I'm not saying that's the answer, but you know, it's part of it. Yes, finally. The person who observes the person getting the injection has to have experienced yes. this, though. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. There are no the obvious the questions. For the first time, I get the first shot. And, right. But from then on, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know that about your pets, right? And children, probably. So yeah. So oh, not mine. Connection <laughs> then between empathy and perception of pain. Yes. It Is seems that that would be a very interesting place to I think so. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. The non empathetic feel yeah. pain. Less or less profoundly, or in a different. I way. don't know the. I, it's a fabulous question, uh, and I don't know the answer. But if you measured the, of course, then there is the cultural. It's complicated because you, the, the, the simple hypothesis would be that people who have a high threshold should be less empathetic, and there is a sense in which people say, "Oh, come on, it doesn't hurt." <laughs> right? Yes. So in that sense. I think it might be true. But then culture, there's the culture playing that may develop empathy, although make you a tough guy. You know, then it gets complicated. But it's a great question to research, at least. And what if, let's say, a diagnosed sociopath mm -hmm. has perfectly normal response like this? So what's, what intervenes yeah. to make them less sensitive? Well, we don't know, right? I don't know. Right, right. Uh, okay. But that's also a great question. Uh, I don't know if they have. The yeah, was it, and the, you're right. So maybe the disconnect is right there already, and maybe it's much higher up. Absolutely. So yes. I've experienced one kind of pain before, such as getting an injection, mm -hmm. because we now have connected these visual neurons to these neurons that are connected with pain. Will the right. next injection hurt even more? It does, but that's separate, because. From what I've just said, no, because oh, because you mean it now your pain neuron is interesting, is receiving input both from right, right, the and the vision. Yes, yes. Wow, you you see, we could set up a whole lab. I I don't know. I, it's uh, but there is something uh, that may or may not be related that. Um, the experience of pain tends to, they, there is a phenomenon that, I've, that has a name that you don't habituate to pain. On the contrary, it, it's like allergies, it gets worse. <laughs> um, but I'm sorry, I don't remember enough, but those are great questions. Mm -hmm. And you would need a pretty precise, I think, neurological, neurophysiological recording to see if that pain neuron is fired. And I think working on pain is tricky, uh, both ethically and, you know, do you want to do it? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's see who. <laughs> yeah. Is there a, like a generalized response to pain? So I'm thinking of like social learning that comes with like bee stings. So even if you've never been stung by a bee, mm -hmm. you see other people freak out. Yes, so right. Is there, like, a, if you've experienced one kind of pain, when mm -hmm. you think about a pain that you've never had before, mm -hmm. does it activate the pain neurons? I would think brain? not, but that's a speculation. Mm -hmm. And here is my personal take on it. In fact, it's, it, I'm the queen of the tangents. I'll try to keep this short. But I was uh, last week at a fantastic monologue by somebody named Mike Daisy. Yeah, from, with the Apple. yeah, exactly. And he is, I mean, I had seen Spalding Gray before, but he is absolutely phenomenal in my view. And this monologue was about memory, a lot of things, uh, including narrative and making the point, and I don't know if he studied psychology or not, but that there are no, almost no raw memory. It, my story has a point related to yours. I, I like to announce that until you don't say more. Oh. Um, and, that, and that's what Proust was trying to do in you know, the remembrance of things, law, things past, thank you. Uh, 
every time you remember something, you remember it a bit differently, you change it, and then in fact, they've shown, I don't have it here, but neurologically, there are new connections being made when you remember something. So what you store again, when you store to be remembered later is not what you got out. So, to, right, so, and Proust were hoping to get to the bottom of this. Well, uh, apparently it can be done. So, and Daisy was talking about everything is narrative and Nancy knows well Jerome Brunner and the idea that uh, we are narrative beings. We make sense through narratives. I'm very sympathetic to that. So he said there is, think about what you remember, right? Remember, try to think of a trip, right? That you really enjoyed and something that struck you. Do you remember, for, I know the first time I saw Venice, no, I was lucky enough to be on a really crummy but whatever boat that came through one of those canals and stopped in front of San Marco. I mean, it was an experience. Do I feel it? No, I'm telling you the story because I'm told it a lot, too much probably, but I don't really remember the experience. Now, those of you women who, have ch who had children, do you remember the pain of childbirth? No, you, when it starts again with your second child, say, oh my God, I remember this. <laughs> but in between, you can't call it up. So that's what Daisy was trying to say. There are no, you cannot evoke. I'm, I'm making a strong statement, mm -hmm. but I certainly have not been able to sit in the chair and ev put myself in a state of pain. Not anymore that I can evoke somebody's face in all the details. Now, that's what I did, memory people can do. But do you see what I mean? So that was a long, long answer that I think <laughs> was relevant to your question, that I don't think one can evoke those raw sensations. Not anymore you can invoke red. You know what red looks like. It's all through language, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should agree with me, obviously. That it's, right? Yeah. When you say you can't evoke the senses, I noticed when you said Venice, you can't <laughs> it up. Yet yeah. when you said Talbert, <laughs> right. you can't Your facial structure and your body sure. is so different. Yeah, but it could be, and here we're probably going too far on my own tangent, but I think it can be through language, right? I, I, that's why when you read novels, you re I mean, I don't know if you do, but you sometimes cry or laugh. So I'm not saying you can't have emotions. I'm talking about the really raw experience or try to imagine a bell. Can you really hear it? Now, some people are better that, than others, for sure. But I, I guess I'm very language filtered. The sense of grief. That you felt it but that's not, that's very uh, cognitive, I mean, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it has I physical, it has but it's not just it's physical. The memory of the experience of grief. Yes. I, you know, when, when I think about someone, in my, yeah. when I think about my dad, yeah. I, I feel that sense of loss again. Yes. Yes. I don't remember the feeling of chapter Exactly, ball. right. Yeah, right. You can tell it, and I mean, you remember in the way we mean remember, but no, ever, know, you can't relive it. I know I don't ever want to relive it, that's right. important. Yeah. but, but I, I certainly still feel that sense of watch, the same way as I still feel that sense of joy from you know, the first minute they put my son in my arms. Uh -huh. It's like, best moment of my life, mm -hmm. far enough. You summed it up when you said the sense of joy. Not well, joy, that's, the sense that's the question, I, right? I, I, I'm still so happy at that memory. Yeah. But uh, that's different, the right? The memory makes you happy. That doesn't mean you, I'm being a bit hard, but, uh, but it doesn't mean you are evoking your happiness from back then. I'm, I'm trying to create the arguments that my students yeah. have created, and they will. And they, will and they are master, yeah. Uh, if you had lived with my son, you would have a long experience to go through. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Think about when you're getting an injection, I'll be using needle folds here, I'm not recovering one. Um, the nurse says, you're going to feel a pinch. Yeah. 
the visualization technique. Yeah. Right? Does that excite the areas? In the well, brain? that was the question before, right? right? That that make us think it's going to be a pinch. Yeah. If she had said it's going to be a needle stick. Uh huh. All right. Or a puncture. Um, a skin puncture. Would it be different? Are you, are you fooling the brain into thinking that, oh, well, it's okay. You expect a pinch. Do you think that's why they say pinch? I always thought it's because what's the right word? I wonder if they're, if they're That's very interesting. It's a visualization. It's going to be a tickle, right. doctor's nurse as a child used to say, you know, it's just a little bee sting. It's like a little bee sting. Well, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now I move to the next presentation. Um, sorry. Glasses. Okay, so what if we didn't feel pain? Now, you probably have the answer, etc., but your students might not, might. the first reaction might be, I don't know. Have you asked them? Oh, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Do they say that? Yeah. 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 OK, so I, I won't go. Do you know about leprosy? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I talk about. And um, talking about brain areas, mm -hmm. so um, I tend to relate no, the area show the areas of the brain not related to pain, and then when we move to touch, I contrast it, etc. Um, so, anyway, yes. What are the what are the self reports of people with the asymbolia for pain? Uh, right. What kind of things do they say? They well, they I haven't interviewed they them. Even say a scale of one to ten, that was an eight. Yeah. They but just don't feel it. Because they, they, they can give it a, I'm asking, I guess, can they give it a label and say, yeah, that was an eight. How do you feel about the eight? And I didn't care. Is no, no. I think it's like asking a blind person what they think okay. color is. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel touch, right? Uh, but I think that if you really don't have it, I, and I, there, is, there are conditions where you just don't have it. Um, and then I don't think it would make any sense, right? And of course, as you know, it's a horrible thing. Of a girl who doesn't feel anything that's been interviewed, and you can find out. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. Oh, good. You talk about how dangerous it is. It is horribly size. dangerous. And pain, and pain is super yes. important. That's right. And now they can't let her do a lot of stuff. And in fact, this is the, an old one, um, but Miss C, right. who died early, and uh, it's about, and again, students are not necessarily aware, but even not turning in your sleep. I mean, the reason you turn in your sleep and that's good for you is because it's painful to be in the same position. So you end up, you know, with lots of uh, skeletal problems, of course, burns and, I mean, bets and yeah. It, and what I read is that uh, individuals without pain die young because it's just too hard to keep oneself alive. Um, culture, ah, uh, that's always a hit. So there is, this is where you can ask me to stop because you know, not everybody likes uh, to hear. So there is a ceremony in a particular uh, region of India where men will put hooks to their back and then I, I haven't seen it. I talk about it as if I did. And will we port not experiencing pain? Uh, although they do, no, in regular life. If you really want to show them something that maybe, maybe it's just a small one minute clip. Remember the old movie, all of us in here that are experienced in <laughs> A Man Called Horse? Uh -huh. Yeah. Where he yeah. becomes a part of the tribe. Yes. They put the hooks in That's his right. His chest. That's right. I, I guess, and yes. then he pulls it back, pulls that's it back, right. pulls it back, it's a part of manhood. Yes, mm -hmm. it's perfect. that's right. That's exactly the same thing, yeah. You're right. Awesome. But it's yeah. only a minute. Yeah. Show them a little tiny minute though. Right, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Man called horse. Who was the guy in it? Richard Harris. Richard Harris. <laughs> 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 
got them into Lakota tribe. Fantastic. And again, he becomes part of the tribe. That's a, a manhood warrior initiation. Warrior initiation. Yeah. Very nice. Good idea. And then this is just uh, how, you know, cultures, it's not just words. I mean, different people, and I'm not saying every, it's you, no, not everybody, blah, blah, but they, on average, in certain culture, people have a higher pain threshold than others. There are also gender differences mm -hmm. um, in our culture and elsewhere. And so here's something uh, you can do is, um, it has a name called the, the, the cold pressure effect, and I never understood why there was the word pressure in it. But anyway, so you hold your hand in very cold water for five minutes, for five seconds, uh, and you wait how cold it is and how unpleasant it is, and then you can do it with hot water or you can call, keep with iced water, and you do it for 10 seconds and you wait how unpleasant it is, etc. And then you ask students before they do it to uh, predict how the sensation of cold and the unpleasantness are going to change with the amount of time. So what's your prediction? Do you understand what I'm saying? So are they going to increase both in the same way or? It'll become less the longer you're I'm sorry? It'll become less, less pain for the longer your hand is in Oh, that's different. That's um, habituation and I don't know if it happens within seconds, actually. I think it, it, it takes a long time before. So let's assume there is no habituation. Yes? I'm thinking the hot water is going to be given yeah, much higher. That's right. The hot water is going to be steeper. How about how cold versus how unpleasant about the ice water? Five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds. I think the ice water is going to be, for me, I would assume it would be much more unpleasant. Right, but how? Okay, sorry. Greater Let, intensity. Yes. So if for five, let's say five seconds, you rate the coldness a five and the unpleasantness a five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ten seconds, you're going to rate the coldness a six or seven, mm -hmm. where will the unpleasant be with respect to that? That's what I'm trying to ask. But as much or less than the sense of cold? Oh, I think you got two things going like this, and are they yeah. going to stay like this, or is one going to go like Right, that's what I'm trying to, thank you. I, I often need translators. Uh, so what do you think? You need a visual, right? Yeah, you need a visual, right? But there's a learning I know that if I put my hand in very hot water, it's going to hurt me. Not yeah. hurt, it's going to hurt me. Yeah, if it's and too hot. If I take it out, it's going what? to continue to hurt. But I know oh, you wouldn't do it with that hot water. Ice cold water, <laughs> when I take my hand out, yeah. my hand will return to its normal temperature true. much faster. There will be no long term effect. That's true. Five seconds in boiling water versus five No, no, I didn't say boiling. <laughs> These are classroom experiences. So hot tub, hot tub, uh, hot tub temperature. <laughs> so you are avoiding the question. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm trying to ask is, will the unpleasantness grow faster with time than the sense of cold? I mean, it's... It will, yeah, it does. Because you don't habituate in that. Because you don't habituate and the unpleasantness goes faster than, than the coldness, which shows that's one very basic way in which to show that temperature, that, that pain is a sense of its own and not just the perception of intense stimuli, which is basically, I think, what's accepted now. Um, when I was a grad student, it was still a question. Um, okay, what causes pain that you know? Um, again, going back to the good old days where women were told that menstrual cramps were just in their heads. Mm -hmm. My answer to that, of course it's in your head, where would it be? <laughs> when you cut your finger, it's also in your head. I mean, there's the cut on your finger, but the pain is not in your finger. So, of course, 
okay, so that's one thing. But we now, I mean, now people understand, you know, the nature of it, and it has to do with again hormones related to histamine, etc. So it, not only now we know it's real, right? Because there's a chemical explanation. Um, I also talk about neopathic pain, meaning pain that has lived its purpose um, and what can and sometimes cannot be done about it. Um, referred pain is interesting. You know the feeling heart attacks in your elbow? No, left arm, something. And the... Um, the explanation, does everybody know? Then I just move on. No. no? The, the explanation that I've read is that embryologically, the, uh, the, pain, the nerves coming, that signal pain coming from your heart and your arm mm -hmm. are linked. Right. And so whether the signal comes from your arm or from your heart, your brain doesn't know, so to speak. Yeah. So they link somewhere together on the neural pathway to the brain. Yes, that's right. And then because we are more familiar with pain in the, uh, our left arm than in our arm than in our heart, that's how we experience it, right? Are you going to talk about Yes, I do. Um, in fact, let's see. It, let me show you. This is a simplified version of my. Uh, pain pathways. And there you go, acupuncture. So um, this is the pain detector in your skin. And it goes to the spinal cord. And then it goes to various brain areas. One is the PAG. Oh, I should have looked that up. Uh, the peri aqueduct gray, something like that. And then the association cortex, the limbic system that you know. Etc. Okay, and then the question is, how do you explain pain no, on the, neurologically this way? And you can understand a lot. So, for example, imagine you know the, being at the dentist. Uh, what does Novo, where does Novocaine? What does Novocaine do? Do you know? Yes, it blocks here, right? So it prevents, it changes the electrical conductivity of your nerve and it prevents, so it's very early in the system, so the pain signal don't even reach the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you go under, as they say, for surgery, that's of course uh, at the brain, at the yeah, upper level. Then aspirin and stuff act on inflammation at the locus of the um, weight where you hurt. Um, I'm not going to do it all, but then uh, acetaminophen. Thank you. <laughs> I usually call it by his brand name. It's easier, <laughs> but then I'm forgetting that one too. So also acts in the spinal cord, uh, etc. So you can explain, for example, why when you hit your finger or your toe, you rub, mm. right? To, and that really helps. And that's called the gate theory of pain, and you know that. And then here, the PAG in the midbrain has a huge role in lots of pain related phenomena. And that's one, there are different hypotheses about acupuncture, but one of them is that it stimulates activity in the midbrain, which uh, and then there is, okay, so this is a non-labeled one. One thing the students have to do is put arrows, you know, do the messages go down or up? So the PAG goes down and blocks, I mean, when it's active, and blocks activity here, so it, it blocks the pain. I mean, not totally, etc. cetera, but um, it inhibits activity here, so then the message, the pain message doesn't make it up. Uh, so that's the theory about acupuncture. It stimulates the activity of the midbrain, of a, an area of the midbrain, which then sends activity down to the spinal cord, which takes care of the pain signals to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, similarly, that's where endorphins are generated. So the runner's high, 
uh, I'm telling you like the gospel, I, that's what I read and uh, there's good scientific evidence for it, whether it's foolproof, probably there will be lots of change, you know this, right? So, <laughs> um, and that's where opiates act as well and they act on the same receptors as endorphins. That's also where self-produced analgesia is, which is this little electrical device. When you have intractable pain, I, again, I hear, you can have a little electrical, like a pacemaker, I, I, that's what I imagine, except it stimulates your midbrain and it gives little burst of electrical activity in your midbrain, which then does its thing like acupuncture, if you wish. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then if hypnosis is higher up, the association cortex can, of course, send signal back, and that's why there are cultural, I mean, that takes care of cultural influences, learning, cognitive effects, and stuff. That has to come from a higher up, obviously, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, so anxiety, on the, on the other hand, excites the limbic system, which excites the, um, the sp nerves, uh, neurons in the spinal cord. And, and then um, fibromyalgia has a lot to do, I mean, there are lots of different theories also about how different unwanted signals are, are generated um, when they shouldn't. Then I talk about the phantom limb pain. Why does it hurt? Mm -hmm. right? And there are also different explanations for that, but essentially the idea is that uh, your the nerves, the nerves are still alive and therefore send signals uh, to your brain, although they don't originate from where they used to originate. And so that's what one thing I use to try to teach students that you, as I put it, you are the mercy of your brain. What that means <laughs> is that whatever the reality is, all you have is the activity in your brain, and if the activity in your brain says, my hand hurts, you, your hand hurts, and the fact there's no hand there is irrelevant. Your hand hurts, right? So that's not necessarily something they think about on a regular basis. Not, I, I'm not saying about amputation, the, <laughs> but in general is that whatever you, uh, that's where my little speech on drugs come in. You know, if you mess up your brain, it, it might be forever and then that's your reality. There is, you can't choose to see things or hear things the way you used to because your brain, it's not just your eyes and your skin and your Years, it's also all the parts of your brain that participate in uh, perception and that shape, we're back to that, that shape your perceptions, experience. And if you mess that up, it will have, uh, it will change your perception in the same, same way as, uh, you know, putting colored glasses, whatever, you see the point. They don't listen, but uh, <laughs> I, I believe about, no, I believe that very deeply. Stress. Uh, also acts at the midbrain level. Okay, and then I gave you a bunch of things to read should you want to know more. Okay. Um, now, I have a third part about touch, but I am not going to do it all. I would like to ask you, is that okay? Uh, questions about pain? We can always talk later. So, why do you need touch? And then I'll show you the, the slide. Yes. yes. To, to develop your brain. To develop your brain. That's a little vague. <laughs> <laughs> I just immediately thought of like, uh, like, um, like Harlow's monkey studies. Like yes. More, no touch, then not the same. Okay, so it's, it's at least socially extremely important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Be aware of movements. Okay, be aware. Sorry, I skipped you. Yes. Absolutely, that's really important and it's not necessarily something students will tell you. Yes? Not related to what he was saying, it's just part of the feedback that we use to now. Yes, okay. Anything else? Yes? About um, Phantom Lens, mm. B.S. Ramachandran. Yes, um, that's right. His TED Talk on YouTube about Phantom Lens, a guy who has severe nerve damage in his, in his existing arm, mm -hmm. to the point where he asked to be amputated, Okay, the arm is cut off, <sighs> and, and then he has the same phantom pain. Oh my God! Which Ramachandran is like, okay, I can't cut his arm off now because it's already gone. 
He's got agonizing pain, which won't respond to yep. any of that stuff. Yep. So eventually he works out a mirror box in which he has a mirror image of the existing normal arm. Yeah. Right? He has him has him work work the normal arm so it looks like both limbs are now operating normally without pain. Mm -hmm. Cures it. So right. vision over over Wow. You have to see this. It's the feedback. I, it's yeah. There's no feedback anymore. That's yeah. that's right. It's just, no feedback. It's relaxed. Right. And now there right. Now, now there is Maybe I wonder if one could cure tinnitus the same way because tinnitus is also, you know, uh, I mean, things taking over where they shouldn't. And in fact, I hear mine a lot more in quiet settings than when there are other, and it's not because it covers it, it's because it's, if there are noises, real ones, <laughs> you know, it stimulates the auditory system and then the, the spurious ones don't. Uh, the neurons are busy, you no know, responding to real things. So I think there is a similarity. That's we, yeah. He's one of the pioneer about uh, somatosensory systems, and uh, it's complete. It's Rama Chandran. He's in California, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. What else with touch? Anything else? So. Socially, yes. I, I don't know if I missed this, but I just keep thinking of like Harry, Harry Harlow and attachment. And yeah, about right. Okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sexuality. I'm sorry. Sexuality. Yes, right. That's what I delicately put as social. <laughs> Absolutely, from babies to teenagers to, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, and uh, no, one can venture in it. And in fact, the textbook I use say, try to imagine sex without touch. And I don't know if you can say that. In, at college you can, but uh, I don't know if you can say that in high school. Can you? Yeah? Okay. Um, all right, well, students often think about the social aspect and Rarely, th mine not necessarily bring up all the role of touch in motor behavior and try to button your shirt, you know, without touch. And when you, I, what I try to explain is when you're very cold and you, you can't button or unzip or whatever, it's not because your motor neurons are not working, it's because your sensory neurons are not working. And anyway. So it's crucial to any movement. So I make a big deal out of that. So we, oh, sorry, I have to turn this on. Uh, there we go. So first of all, that's how you swat flies or whatever that l land on your arm even when you don't see them, right? You're very sensitive you, you, and that's built in reflex for good reasons. Uh, information about objects. So try to imagine picking up you know, a tennis ball versus a crystal glass. Right? Now, even if you look at it and think about the role of touch in doing both successfully. And so what specifically, and it's probably obvious, but uh, that's no, the lecture on this. Um, what kind of information do your hands give your brain, essentially, so that you successfully you know, pick up the crystal glass without breaking it, and the tennis ball, whatever? What do you think is relevant? The weight. The weight, exactly. So one thing is you will lift you are just to wait, so you live properly. And in fact, there is, I, I don't think it's on YouTube, it's probably way too old, but there is a very cute thing with babies where, um, 12, uh, uh, let's say, one, one year old, and they, you give them something to lift, right, repeatedly. Uh, it's, about, it's really an experiment about conserva and conservation, but anyway. So it's a bar, and they lift it, and they, you can see they get used to it, and now they don't go whatever. They, and then you fold the bar into two, so now it looks half the size. Uh, and the young babies pick it up and they're, ah! <laughs> because, uh, 
no, it's a reverse, whatever. They, they expected a different weight. Um, so what are the things, so how do we know the weight of something without putting it on a scale, obviously? We, there is learning, absolutely, which is why if it was a trick tennis ball, whatever, yes, but it's more than that. Okay, that's part of it, but uh, certainly, they, and that's why there is the size weight illusion because with, with more compact water, things. With water, in, with water in this, yes. it's, pushing, it's pushing down Absolutely. my hand more than it goes Yes, through. right, but there's more th to it than that. Sure. You're right, it's very important. It's visual, I mean, that's a huge thing. It's not so huge. I look at an empty water bottle and I know it's going to be light and True. I get a full one and I know it's going True. to be heavy. I know about but if I blindfolded you, you would still very successfully lift both. I, I considered doing it and then I said, uh, <laughs> what? I might be a little awkward at first if I'm blindfolded not quite knowing what to expect. Right. Yes, at the very first, but it might, the, but. After the first millisecond. The yeah. Like yes, cup, exactly. And if my cup's empty, the minute I pick it up, I sense a, so look, a lot of things about it. Exactly. Right now it's full and it feels, and I sense something so totally different about it in my, mm -hmm. in my like, space, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. body, sense, you know, the whole Absolutely. sense of it. I don't know what the word is. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's like five or six things that have to be going on for me to do this. So, w look, she's holding it like this, right? So, and I'm not proving you wrong, you're absolutely right, right? So what else, what is telling her that the cup is of a certain weight? The pressure that you have to put against it, so hold it. Okay, so there is slipperiness. So you have skin detectors that tell you how slippery things are, I mean, how, it's slippage, slip, yeah, slippage how is. is what? How solid it is as opposed yes, to right. So the some detectors, some sort of detectors, measure how how much it's pulling down, and then you adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, other detectors will tell you how it reacts to. You will no, but that's not the, the end of the story, right? Because the detectors are not. They not don't have any brains, so. What is it with the, the tennis ball versus, uh, sorry, I've been ignoring you. Um, thinking of a beer stein and a wine glass, yeah. and you're blindfolded. Yeah. Identical texture. Yes. So you're sensing a glass, mm -hmm. but you'd be able to tell something about this by well, how much force it takes to displace them in space. Yes. And to move them around. So I could, if I'm using the same identical pressure against both glass objects, oh. all right, then I can feel the wine glass tipping yes, that's and true sliding, too. whereas the beer sign is in the same right. place with the same amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so physics is there too, but let's talk, so you are, let's say, pushing, it's probably not a good idea to do it fully, but so you're pushing on both, right? Plenty of space. Yeah, yeah. plenty of space and da da da. How does, and you blindfolded, what information goes to the brain to tell you about that one is more massive than the other? Well, you're feeling shape, quantity, okay. texture. I mean, when we say the word, when you say the word feeling or touching, it's so much more. Right, but my question is, what I try the students to do is to go beyond that. Yes, we feel all that. How? What is the information that goes to your brain so that you experience texture? It do, it's like the apple doesn't go to your brain. Texture doesn't go to your brain either. It's something else. So what's it's the intermediary? Do you see what I mean? So what kind of information is it that allows you to perceive texture or how resistant the two glasses are or, or whatever else? I mean, no, it's not. It's a bit different explanation, but the, the general idea is the same. Yeah, you, sorry. <laughs> is it, are you just looking for the fact that it's a neurochemical event? Oh, no, yeah, right. You see too many whys. Right. <laughs> it is a, so what I'm saying is, no, what I'm not saying, what I should have said is 
when you do this to a tennis ball versus uh, a baseball, or you push two things of different masses, whatever, right? Your sensors, your touch receptors, are responding to something in the same way. I mean, not in the same way, but no, the retina, re the, the retina receptors respond to light, right? So that's all they do. They're responding to something. And then they, the nerve signals that come from your touch receptors are exactly the same nerve signals as the ones in your optic nerve. I mean, not at the same time, but it's, if you look at the nerve signal, you don't know whether it's about touch or sight or anything. It's just a nerve signal. So what makes you t see versus t uh, feel is where in your brain it goes, but that's a separate issue. So what is it that they're encoding, would say information processing people? What information do, th do those nerve signals carry? They just little beep, 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 beep. No, not even. It's just the, it's, they all beep, 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 but different patterns. So what is it from the outside that is encoding in the nerve signals about holding something? It's all pressure-related. Ah, it's pressure-related, yes. Uh -huh. Well, you see, I don't disagree. Experience is usually important. The thing is, as clumsy as they are, babies do the same thing. So there is, again, a part that's not learned. You have to learn in order to look at something and know how to handle it more. First of all, and let me, I want to get to the end, I mean, not the end, to the Pride and Daily Marathon, because everybody has, it's, it's terribly written, but it's terribly informative, and it's about a young man who doesn't have touch. Okay, so that's for you and the vision. So he sees perfectly well. He could not do anything of the things that we have talked about. And he knows, I mean, he lived for 20 years with touch, but he keeps waiting in things. He cannot do anything at first, but it, it's really, a, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what is it that touch, you know, pressure? Okay, so. Hmm? I think what you're driving at is it's, it's text, many different types of texture. It could be a texture but texture is the percept. The question is, what's the intermediate? What's the mediator? What, what the pressure, the text, assuming you not count and the, 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 the texture is really there, <laughs> right? I'm, right? I'm there. It's not, an illusion, like it's not an illusion. So, and then you rub, you know how in stores, I don't know if men do it too, when you, you know, you're always feeling close, right? Okay, so corduroy versus the, the, all right. You mean sensory neurons? I'm sorry. Are you looking for sensory neurons? No, I'm looking for the encode, the inf what kind of information, if you had, okay. Let me try again, and then I'll, I'll get to Pride and Dairy Marathon because I'm getting, I'm just dragging you into this. <laughs> I often tell the student, if you had to build a robot, and I do that with cognitive development, to, and in fact, there's a famous paper called How to Build a Baby. So that's the idea. How would you build your robot? Not that he, has, he or she has the experience of, that's metaphysics, but that it holds and I'm, there is such a problem with robots, actually, mm -hmm. right? So they don't crush mm -hmm. what they hold. So wh what information does the robot have to be sensitive to in order to hold the glass, per, per, uh, throw the ball, whatever? How does Superman, not, how does Superman know not to break the wine glass when it holds it? Oh, super, why? Why Superman? Superman uh, true, but, but presumably he had the same sort of sensory system we do, right? It's resistance. It's resistance. Okay. All right. It, it's as simple as that in a way, but either I'm well aware I didn't ask my questions properly, but certainly it, I don't think it's necessarily obvious because like with the apple, it's there. The texture is there. The glass, of course, the glass is slippery, so it slips. 
Well, the question is, how do you know it's slippery? And it has, it's everything is temporal, tempor, spatial temporal patterns of pressure. And that's all touch is. So this immense world of being able to walk, being able to hold, to button, to hold the baby, da, 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 is only pattern information about how pressure changes. How much of it there is and how it changes in time. It's all the relative amount of pressure against yes. the skin surface and therefore yes. the receptors fire. And exactly. Surface. And that's all they do. Now, there are four kinds and they don't, are not sensitive to the same patterns of pressure. And that's the beauty what I'm in love with, but we won't have time. And how combined, that's your touch world, which is huge. And it's all time space dependent patterns of pressure. I find, again, that absolutely fascinating. Um, anyway, thank you for your patience. So let me get to uh, Ian uh, in the, so that you have all of that. So uh, the person in purple at the back there, I'm sorry, I don't know your names. Bad student, that's okay. Oh, Peter, in t to go back to your two glasses, it's when you push action and reaction, the thing is pushing back on you, and your sensory receptors, your touch receptors, just say how much pressure there is on them. Uh, so you have, I know you can do it, but the students don't necessarily focus on the objects, not necessarily on the action of the objects on them, and that's what is sometimes. Uh, tough to carry. So, Pride and the Daily Marathon, I'm just going to give you a, over, I mean, a, a little taste of it. It was written by the, either the therapist or the, neuro, uh, the, the neurologist of this young man who one day literally woke up without a sense of touch. He could feel temperature, he could feel pain, and, it, and his muscles worked, I mean, the muscles were intact, but then the question was how to move, to move them. And it happened because of a viral infection that destroyed his sensory fi his touch fibers, essentially. And you know, you don't come back from that. Um, and so the book is about both the neurophysiology aspect of it, uh, but also his experience. And I don't know about you, but I. I knew I needed it for walking, etc. But until you read that, I think you realize how, how deep it goes, how much you need touch in the center. So he is in his bed, right? He work, wakes up and he tries to sit up. He can't. He can't. Um, so he tries to remember how one sits up. And he thinks somehow that. Tensing his stomach muscles has something to do with, as we know, sit up, <laughs> has something to do with it, nothing. He just, he's perfectly, he has the same brain he had the day before, he's perfect, but he cannot do it. And then he realizes it has to do with gravitational thing, that he has to bend his head forward to sort of bring his, doesn't really matter the specific. He, so he has to reinvent the simplest, of motions, and I want to go back to the first comment that the, well, what's his name? Yeah, you, <laughs> sorry, but I, I cannot uh, call by names because I don't know your name. Okay, so you had brought the first thing you said early, very early on is uh, we need touch to, to move, did you say? To be aware of our movements. Yeah, to be aware of our movements, and that's something that I don't think is that much known is that you cannot, without touch, you cannot decide, even when you look at your arm, you cannot decide to move from here to there. Because in order for your brain to do the command to move from here to there, your brain has to know where your arm is, not visually, touch wise. Mm -hmm. And so without touch, your brain is missing that information and therefore cannot generate any controlled movement. Well, that's in Ian Waterman's case. Yes. And actually, if you search for him online, there's a bunch of, yeah. earlier before I saw this, I was like, going to bring him up, and that's you had him in here. Yeah. But you can watch little video clips and things. Oh, yeah? The BBC had done an interesting documentary Great. on him, but you can watch little clips of it. 
But in this case, he like retrained himself. He retrained water, himself. It was all through sight. Yeah. Like he had That's to, right. And if you shut off the lights on, they talked about how like he fell. Night, the power went out. He just collapses to the ground. Think of it. If you have no because sensation. He no longer knows where his body parts are in relation That's right. to one another. So and sometimes his, well, his arms would fling yeah, out because the brain, it's not that the brain doesn't give random, as you know, commands, but no, totally. Uh, and so he did retrain himself through sight. Uh, he call, literally called and then walked. And uh, as soon as it's dark, he, 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 he dr now think of driving because he, he got back to driving. Now, imagine not having proprioception and the car next to you move. How do you know it's the other car or you? Wow. Right? Yeah, that's the train sort of illusion. It, I mean, the courage, it, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also, I mean, not everyone can do that, and other people who have that condition choose to stay in wheelchair. I mean, uh, it's just too hard. And um, he lived, I, I, did he die? He, I just brought him up a little bit ago. I, I don't know. I'm not anyway, uh, but, and then he ended up even building stone walls. I mean, and, and trying to have a normal life. But just a description of what it means to sit up or to, to hold an apple. <laughs> or, uh, and then he becomes a, um, a clerk in um, a company. And t talking about the crystal glass, he's trying to hold, he has to distribute sheets of paper to different offices. And you know, how much pressure do I put not to crush this paper, but still not have the papers and, and on and on and on and on. It's, I think that really brings home, um, even you know, at a different level, the importance of touch. Yeah, his name is Ian Waterman. Um, so, I'll, I'll, perfect. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much for your interest, and I'd be glad to answer questions.